They're good. People are showing up good. These, these Zoom readings remind me of New York City readings, right? Awesome. <laughs> like, oh, will you come? Oh, yes, exactly. No, everybody exactly. just shows up at, at the last minute. Yeah. Oh, God, it was always so stressful. It was always so stressful. It was very hard. We can uh, get started so you guys have plenty of time to do your thing. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to another PMP Live. My name is Bashan. I am part of the event staff with Politics and Pros. Before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of items. First being that at any point during the event, you can go to the chat section and you'll be able to find a link which will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of Guillotine. Of course, we highly encourage and thank each of our loyal customers for your continued patronage. Um, additionally, we would ask that if anyone viewing would like to ask a question of any of the authors, you would separately place that in the Q&A box, not the chat section, just so it can help us kind of keep everything uh, organized and help facilitate the question and answer period. Um, this PMP Live will feature a poetry panel. Uh, they explore themes uh, to include violence, race, culture, and writing about the personal and political at once. Um, the panelists we have with us today feature one uh, in no order of importance, but here's Tommy Blount. He, Tommy is a Cave Canem alumnus and author most recently of Fantasia for the Man in Blue. In his debut collection, Tommy orchestrates a chorus of distinct, unforgettable voices that speak to the experience of the Black queer body as a site of desire and violence. Additionally, we have with us today, Maya Popa. Maya is a Romanian American poet and the author of two chat books, The Bees Have Been Canceled and You Always Wish the Animals Would Leave. Her latest collection, American Faith, begins the manifestation of violence in our country, a destruction, a destructive administration, a history of cruelty and extermination, and a love of firearms the kind of violence naturally extends to the personal. Uh, lastly, but certainly not least, we have Eduardo Corral. Eduardo is the author of Slow Lightning, plus his newest collection, Guillotine, uh, which was long listed for the 2020 National Book Award. Congratulations. Um, told through the voices of undocumented immigrants, border patrol agents, and scorn lovers, the collection traverses desert landscapes, cut through by migrants, the grief of loss, betrayals, lingering scars, the border itself, great distances in which violence and yearning find roots. And without further ado, Eduardo, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Rashan. Thank you, politics and uh, pros of Rashan, my apologies. Uh, thank you for the kindness opening your space to me, Tommy and Maya. Thank you, Tommy and Maya for joining me. What a pleasure. Before we begin, a round of applause for Tommy, who is a finalist for the National Book Award with Fantasia for the Man in Blue. Thank you, Bravo, Eduardo. Tommy. Thank Bravo. you, thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> how, did you, how did you find out? Via text message or uh, your phone going uh, off the hook? Yeah, my phone was, so here's, here's what was happening. So I've been working from home <laughs> And, um, and I noticed that my, my phone kept like buzzing and buzzing <laughs> yeah. and I was getting pissed because I was trying <laughs> to get work done and work is crazy right now. Yeah. And I said, whoever this is, I'm going to curse them out. As soon as I get to my phone, I'm going to curse them out. And then I saw all these notifications and I, and you know, I, <laughs> I died a little bit and then I was like, oh my God, oh shit. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a lot of big, big feelings. Uh, yeah, Wonderful. yeah, richly deserved. So, I'm so, so thank I you, talking. Eduardo. That means a lot. I yelped, I yelped with pleasure when I saw uh, oh, that. Means so much thank to you. Me. Uh, yeah, today, uh, everybody who's joining us, thank you so much. Uh, today, we're all going to take turns reading a poem. And before we read the poem, we're going to talk about its origins, maybe an element, a craft element that animates it, maybe it's give it some context or how we came to write the poem. Period. These are always my kind of favorite moments at a poetry reading where that poet gives an insight into how the poem came into being. Some of the struggles maybe of writing or revising that poem, right? I always find them so very informative and helpful and also keeps reminding me 
yes, these poems, it's sometimes an obstacle, a struggle, a journey to get to something that's interesting and surprising on the page, right? It doesn't happen overnight, right? right? Often it's syllable by syllable that we write these poems. So in that spirit of that sharing about the craft process, the origins, that's our event. And uh, Tommy's gonna read first, then Maya, then me, then, and then we'll circle back again. Yeah. So Tommy. I was going to, you know what, Eduardo, I was gonna do something all big and fancy, but now I don't wanna do it. So I'm just gonna, you know, um, so about three years ago, um, three or four years ago, I became obsessed with um, fashion mm. and um, not in like a trendy sense, but like the history around fashion, particularly as it pertains to like black people and their bodies. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the stories that caught me um, I found it in, um, it's a, I call it a dual memoir. It's, uh, it's called The Gods and Kings, The Rise and Fall of Alexander McQueen and John Galliano and by, by Dana Thomas. And there's this one story in there about um, Alexander McQueen approaching um, the black model, Deborah Shaw to wear this particular piece of jewelry um, that was designed by his, a frequent collaborator of his named Sean Lean. And it's this square um, with manacles and shackles mm. at each corner. And so, <laughs> and so of course, Deborah Shaw, uh, I mean, you know, Deborah Shaw and Alexander McQueen were friends and she had been in a few of his, his shows. Um, and so when she saw that, when she, when she saw the, the piece of jewelry, she went, oh, wait, no, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. this reminds me of slavery. This reminds me of, you know, the, the collars and uh -uh. no, no, no. And so, of course, Alexander McQueen uh, did that thing that we see a lot happening in fashion today, too, where he went, oh, no, 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 that wasn't my intent. That was not my intent at all. Oh, no, no, no. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's this is about fashion. You know, this is about, um, you know, this is, this is about the opposite of that. We're about, you know, fighting against Aryan notions of beauty. Um, and so Deborah Shaw wound up being in the show, it worked. And so when I, when I read that, um, I kept going back and forth, like, what would I do? You know, um, what side of the coin would I be on in that? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that, it, that, that, whole, that whole thing was, emblematic of like America's relationship with black people overall. Like there's this, there's this kind of gaslighting that happens, not just black people, but you know, a lot of marginalized groups. And it's like this gaslighting where um, they're saying, oh no, no, that's not what we meant at all. And, and so I wrote this poem, Framing Deborah Shaw. Um, and it's in a voice, I describe the voice as um, a fashion critic or at least that's how I imagine the, okay. him being, who, who may or may not believe what he is saying, um, which, is, which was my way of getting around, um, my way of getting around being on one side of the coin or another side of the coin, because I'm not a poet who is, um, what's the word, uh, diagnostic or, you know, I, I don't like to, I don't like to guide my readers with a heavy hand. And so a lot of my, that's why a lot of my voices, they have this sort of uh, wobbly tone to them. They're sort of serious, but not, and there's a little smirk in it, you know? So I'll read the poem as soon as I drink water. <laughs> Framing Deborah Shaw. I felt as if my body was in a picture frame. A simple math of angles, really. Nothing too fussy. A square. Soldered at each corner a ring. Sound design. Just thin enough not to be confused for shackles. There are no chains. Little bangles to meet her biceps, garter her strong upper thighs. See, there is room for her to slip out of them if she chooses. McQueen asked. She had a choice. Okay. 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 
<laughs> she was made aware of the frame, open to opening the show. To show, McQueen said, Aryan notions of beauty are ridiculous. So why not open her body as the entryway, her walk barely a walk, an animal scuttle? Does she even feel it when her thighs pillow her down the steps? Is there an ache? Her soul slosh the runway filled with black water. It isn't that deep, a tributary to hop across or a mouth open to trouble the hound eyed camera sniff for the smell of genius. Everyone collapse for her or or not for her, the simple black mesh dress, its beaded fringe. How, as graceless as she appears, she manages not a rip or tear. Isn't it a miracle? McQueen's folly, his imagination, a savagely dark and beautiful thing. That's the poem I ended up with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh. I loved hearing the story behind that. I loved that poem when I read mm. it the first time, and now I mm. love it even more. So thank you for that. And thank you, Politics and Prose and Eduardo, for having me. I feel um, incredibly fortunate to be with such esteemed company and, um, and to get to talk about these poems. Usually at poetry readings, um, I tend to temper or cushion my political poems um, in the long side, the personal ones, because I fear exhausting an audience, but you all came here to be exhausted tonight. So that's really good <laughs> news. And um, that was fair as well for me. So um, I guess the first poem I want to talk about is the opening poem in the collection. Um, its title is a sort of disingenuous misdirect. It's called Minds Not a Political Heart. And then it goes on, um, of course, to be political, the book itself and um, sort of the nature of the poem. But one thing I was thinking about when I wrote this poem, um, as you'll see, is the performativity in political roles that we see more and more, of course, um, or that we've always, I suppose, seen historically um, in, in, you know, um, roles entertained by world leaders. I was thinking about Putin and uh, a particular anecdote that has always stuck with me um, is the following. So there's a film that you may be familiar with from the early 2000s, it's sort of kitschy, uh, called Fly Away Home, in which a teenage girl essentially adopts a, a group of uh, motherless birds and then manages to build a plane and fly them um, to wherever they need to hibernate for the winter. Um, and it, of course, this has a very sentimental premise and, and, you know, it's one that when I was young, I thought was incredibly charming. Um, who more or less recreated this himself in real life with a group of endangered Alaskan cranes. Mm -hmm. He um, piloted a plane, uh, rather poorly in fact, killed a, a number of the cranes. Um, and it seems slapstick and ridiculous and then the closer you look at it, the more I find it to be unbelievably sinister and su suggestion of a kind of egotism and megalomania that is chilling when you consider this is a world leader who consistently ends up in the paper for stunts that seem utterly sort of misplaced and trite and unprofessional. Um, and of course, this rings true in a number of ways with um, what we're seeing today. Uh, with how our figures end up in the papers for things that are are not are not good, um, and so I wrote a poem around that. And I should say that the it's glib; it has moments of of dark or black humor, but it's not um, that's not a coping mechanism so much. I believe as a way, although it is also a coping mechanism, but as a way to sort of see the irony, the dark irony that runs through so much of. The language, the political language, and of our experience of politics um, currently. So without further ado, mine's not a political heart. All of my childhood fantasies, ice skates with Alaskan cranes, treasure diving in the Black Sea, Putin has beat me to them. He drapes a medal over his shadow, then extradites the dead from purgatory. I live with this dead weight of humor and scorn until the humor burns out. I know my birthmarks aren't heraldic, the sunspots 
transcribed don't form a line of sheet music. Blinking, I kill a group of gnats. I kill only to see clearly. Give me refuge from that sentence, freedom from the choir sanctioning. Each day, the grail looks more like a chalice. Each day, the chalice more like a mug. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, thank you. Yay. Uh, I'm gonna read from Guillotin, my little second book that came out in August. Um, the first poem I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read is titled Autobiography of My Hungers and its title is taken from a memoir by Rigoberto Gonzalez. Uh, when I first started drafting this poem, this poem had an epigraph and it's halfway through the drafting process, I jettisoned the epigraph as, as often we do, right? But there's something about ep epigraphs that I, I want to say. Uh, Slow lightning had an epigraph until the moment I sent it off to the contest, right? To the very last minute, Slow lightning, my first book, had an epigraph, right? Then I, I figured at the end, last minute, I said, no, it's not gonna work. It's not right, right? But I've never revealed to anybody what the epigraph is, right? And I always encourage my thesis students, right? Uh, especially because we workshop everything at the graduate level, we share our work with our colleagues, our peers, with each other on social media, especially for first book poets. I think it's very important to keep something intimate between just you and your first book, something that nobody will ever know, all right? All right? So we don't give it away all. So when it's published in the world, something is still private between you and that first book, all right? That way, there's still a kinship there, right? That nobody can take away, right? And that's always, I like to give that advice to uh, thesis students, first book poets, right? Uh, cultivate one kind of intimacy with, between your first book that nobody will have, ever have access to, right? One thing I wanted to do in my second book was to veer closer to the actual, to memory, to experience, right? To risk vulnerability, uh, transgressiveness, right? Rawness. Uh, so when I first started drafting this poem, I really, I cleaved very closely to this very specific memory and of the speaker and, the, and, the, and their beloved, the one they desire, uh, having a conversation, drinks in a bar, right? I forced, in every draft, I forced the language into that very specific memory. Draft after draft after draft, the language I poured into that very specific memory. That memory became a constriction, right? It was so narrow for me, that the language had no breathing room. The language had no way to kind of branch off, to veer off into maybe other things it, want, it might want to talk about, right? When I transformed the constriction, aka the memory, into a filter, then the poem started coming together. I pushed other memories through that bar scene. I pushed other language, other experiences. And when I started doing that, when the memory didn't, when the memory became filter, not constriction. And then when the drafts started to excite me and then eventually I finished the poem. This poem braids together uh, that moment with his two at the bar and also uh, talks about coming of age at the height of the AIDS epidemic uh, before the cocktails. And also uh, talks about body image, right? Autobiography of my hungers. His beard, an avalanche of honey, an avalanche of thorns. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. Liar, even my soul is pot-bellied. Thinness in my mind equals the gay men on the nightly news, kissed by death and public scorn. The anchorman declaring weight loss is one of the first symptoms. The Portuguese have a word for imaginary, never to be experienced love. whoop de doo I don't love you, he said. The words flung him back in his eyes, I saw it. To another bar where a woman sidestepped his desire. Another hunger, our friendship. In 10th grade, weeks after my first kiss, my mother said, you're looking thinner. That evening, I smuggled a cake into my room. I ate it with my hands, licked buttercream off my thumbs until I puked. Desire with no future, bitter longing. I starve myself by yearning for intimacy that doesn't and won't exist. 
holding hands on a ferry, tracing with the tip of my tongue a jawline. In a bar too close to the Pacific, he said, I don't love you, but not, be but not because I couldn't be attracted to you. His beard, an avalanche of thorns, an avalanche of honey. I love that poem, Eduardo. Thank I you. really do. I just, yeah. So because you read that poem, I'm going to, um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to change my plan a little bit. So I'm going to read um, my guzzle at the end of the book, um, well, towards the end of the book called The Hunger of Luther Vandross. You know, um, for years, yeah. I, I pronounced that uh, uh, poetic term as gazelle. Gazelle. And then some people and then some people <laughs> pronounce it huzzle. Yes, I think it yes. is. Yes. And so like <laughs> and so I always tell people I'm from Detroit. I say guzzle. <laughs> I'm coarse like that. I say guzzle. So I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so with with this uh poem, so selfishly, I just wanted to write poems about Luther Vandross because he was so he meant so much to me. Um, growing up and just uh, and just in the black community means a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, so that poem it sits it it it's where um, it sort of picks up this one of the threads in the book. I'm trying not to give away too much, but it it picks up one of the threads in the book, which is hunger. Um, it's in this other poem I'm going to talk about that's at the beginning of the book, but it really comes to a head in this poem. Mm. And, um, and so with the guzzle form, um, I wanted, I wanted something, I wanted there to be this, uh, this sensation of like bursting open because with the guzzle, with the guzzle, you know, we typically have these closed couplets, you know, um, that are self-contained and, and, uh, that's not, that's not what I wanted for this poem and this book. One of the challenges um, for me put in putting to the book together was, um, was taking up space and earning space. Mm. Um, I have a problem with it, doing that. In my, you know, in my regular life, I have a problem with doing that. And so with this book, that was one of my, um, one of the tasks that I assigned to myself was to, to demand space, to take up space as a black, gay man, um, take up space and earn it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so with this, with this Luther Vandross poem, um, it, it's that same thinking, but on a, on a smaller scale. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, yeah, and there's something about, with Luther, there's something there's something about the, the way hunger drove his life or it seemed to drive his life, right? Um, in that public way where we saw his, you know, his weight fluctuating back and forth. But there's also that private way where we're starting to find out now that you know, he was a gay man, mm -hmm. uh, closeted, you know, um, which made, him, made me love him even more, um, made him one of the muses to the book. He's one of the, um, the men in blue of the book. Um, he's the final man in the blue of the book, actually. Um, so yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just read it and leave it at that. Cause I can ramble, I can ramble all day. <laughs> Let me sip some water. The Hunger of Luther Vandross. Honey, what would a thinner man know of hunger? I mean to be forever, for always in hunger. When my mouth has had enough, when my body goes quiet, I let my mouth take over. It's a calling, this hunger to sing for a love I'm too ashamed to want for myself. So I practice. The pitch has to be right to sing the hunger of other lovers, a take on a take, a rendition no one has heard before. With this voice, I wed the lives of others, a hunger to set the mood. I make them turn the lights off, turn them on, a gift, this first instrument of hunger, this tenor. 
I can feel it in my body. All 300 pounds of me. You're never lonely when you're a man who knows hunger like I do, as big as two men holding on so tight that you would think there is only one of me. There are two of me, both of us hungry for the stage. Look at how the spotlight searches for me. They can't keep up. They chant my name, want more of me. Who am I to let them starve? The terrific persona poem. Yeah, that was that was that was yeah. That's a, that's one I love reading. I just I just yeah. <laughs> Who am I to let them starve? Is a killer last night. I mean that is excellent. <laughs> Hearing those two poems side by side is a joy. And Eduardo, I'm actually teaching your book this week, so everything that you say is super helpful. I can just um, tell my students yeah. sort of the backstories to this or show them. Um, I'll try to stay with the theme of hunger, although pretty grim in this book. Um, so the last poem I wrote for this collection is called American Cowboy. Um, and it thinks about um, a particular incident that may be familiar to some of you. And I'm sure there's a, you'll pick up on a theme here, which is that many of the poems were written in response to things that were happening um, in the news or that were being documented in other forms of language that I found to be insufficient to what I was experiencing. So I wrote into those moments um, in a deeper, in what I hoped was a deeper way. Um, the moment in question is uh, when Roy Moore took out a gun at a rally and um, essentially shot, fired blank shots in the air and said, I believe you know, and the right to bear arms. And the crowd went crazy. I mean, it, it was such an unbelievably performative moment. And of course, um, given our country's current pandemic of gun violence, one I found horrendously disappointing, sinister, just, you know, you want to, I, I felt like I wanted to shake every person in that audience. Mm -hmm. um, and so beyond, you know, without the ability to do that, um, I started to think, where is this iconography coming from? So this like white dudes coming out in like cowboy boots and ha cowboy hat with his gun, like a cowboy <laughs> and um, people are responding to it. Uh, not an appetite, I understand. Uh, the other quote it was sort of thinking about was Sylvia Plath's declaration in her tour de force poem, Daddy, in which she says, um, every woman loves a fascist, the boot in the face. So I suppose those were the two moments um, in the back of my mind as I tried to craft a poem that would, again, try to exhume or understand um, a, a kind of mythos that's not mine, right? I'm, I'm, my parents are Romanian. They're, um, you know, refugees who came to this country in the 80s. The myth is not my myth, the myth of the cowboy. Um, and, and Western iconography in general is not my, my story. And it's not the story for many of us and yet we live under it, right? And so that's sort of the palpable, um, the palpable fuel of this one. American Cowboy. When the politician takes his gun out on stage, we're meant to feel wonder. He hasn't shot us, grateful to leave with our lives. It nears the feeling maybe in Platt's daddy the boot in the face. When the white man walks on stage in cowboy boots and hat, a shorthand. But I don't wish his body near my own, hear it. Don't mistake terror for adoration. There's no plot in the old Western, only masculine delirium and the promise, part childish, part challenge of frontier, gold humming in the nearest river, vigil of buffalo grazing through the night, and the tumbleweed, a complicated thing, gaining momentum around an emptiness. Truly, inside is nothing, and it protects that nothingness that built it, this, its language, its politic. What will it take to start over again with a myth we might perhaps outlive? 
It's the cowboy who the cowboy saves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a powerful last line. Yeah, and I also love goat humming in the river. This Thanks. Thank you. I feel in delirium. I need to tattoo that. <laughs> I well, really we can do. get matching if you'd like. Yes. <laughs> Somewhere else. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the title poem. Uh, the title poem from Guillotine. Um, this poem had this has a kind of distinct beginnings for, in, in for me. You know, like all poets, I carry around a word or a phrase or an image in my mind for days, for weeks, for months, for years. And years ago, I was carrying the word guillotine inside of me. And uh, usually, after dwelling with a word, living with a word. Um, after a few months or a few weeks, something will spark. Another image will be given to me. Another line will be given to me. But for some reason, guillotine refused to give me anything, right? So uh, one day at a coffee shop in Jackson Heights, when I was still living in Queens, I sat down, opened my notebook, and wrote out the word guillotine in it by hand, filled up the whole notebook with that word. And then I looked at the, I said, okay, what do you see now in that tangle of cursive, in that tangle of guillotine? What do you see? I saw scorpions. And I said, what else do you see? And then I saw the controlling image for the poem. So that's how this poem kind of came to me. I kind of forced it into existence, right? By, by just taking that word and just writing it, down, writing it down by hand, right? And I'm so thankful for my really messy handwriting because that cursor was such, it really was a knots and tangles and it was horrible, right? It was horrible, but it gave me a gift. I often contend that to be a really good poet, we just have to remember being four or five, six years old, the way we treated language at that time, right? How free we were with it, how we played with it, how it was elastic, right? How we learned it could be transgressive in certain situations. Don't say that, right? That kind of stuff, right? And then we start learning there's a pr private language at home and a public language outside, right? And then poetry is kind of a braiding of those two, right? So yeah, I don't like to say that too often because, you know, otherwise, I would have no job <laughs> if, we all start, if we all remember that, right? So this poem is the title poem, uh, Guillotine. The scorpions always arrive at dawn. Gently, their pincers touch the cuts on my lips. I clutch the edges of the mattress, stare at the mirrored ceiling. My mouth opens, but no sound staggers out. The scorpions Dank, dank, dark green, dank. Reach in, pull out the razor blade under my tongue. Two scorpions, a razor blade. Slowly, in unison, without letting go of the metal, they move. A little guillotine making its way down my body. I remember dragging my thumb through his beard, coppery and difficult. The scorpions pause, tilt, the blade, a threat, a reminder. It's my task to stop yearning for as long as it takes them to carry a blade across my skin. My thoughts swerve from monsoon storms to accordions to pecan groves. The little guillotine starts moving again. I begin to sense the enormity of my body, the blade high in the air for now. I love that poem. It, Eduardo, it reminds me of, um, well, you're, well, yeah, it, this is a, this is a huge compliment for me. It reminds me of Bridget Beacon Kelly's The Dragon. It, and it, it's part of that poem and also her poem about, the, I didn't ask for a scorpion. Yes, for yes. yes. It's Condorado, yes. that's my favorite poem. Yes. That ends oh with my God. in Alexandria, right? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh you, my goodness! Burn. I get chills when I read your poem. I, I have that. I carry that poem in my mind for yeah. years oh. because at the heart of the second book, you know, well, one of the hearts of the second book, all these unrequited love poems, right? And when yes. that happened years ago, her work was so important to me, especially yes. that scorpion poem. I carried it, right? Yeah. I didn't ask for a scorpion. I asked yes. for a fish, but maybe God misheard me. Yes. It was a bomb for me. It was, it was one way I mended my broken heart by mm -hmm. carrying that word, that poem of hers inside of me. Mm -hmm. And so it's no surprise that uh, oh. something, you know, scorpions would visit me. <laughs> yeah. For the yeah. 
Yeah. It's so, I mean, there's so much, I call it, ma- when I, when I read your, when I read your work, magic pops into my head mm-hmm. every time I read it, because it's, it's, it's like your poems, they have their own, um, like, like BPK, they have their own physics to them, you know, like, mm-hmm. like, um, um, you know, uh, uh, things sort of transform just like that, right? Um, and you believe it, like a mole turns into a rosary bead, and it's there, it has weight, it's mm-hmm. there, it's there, it's magic, love mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would um, like compliment and go to sleep happy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what am I going to read? Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to read, I think I'm going to read Phonophobia. Um, if I can find it. Okay. Phonophobia. So, <laughs> so this poem, yeah. All right, let's see, how can I say this? So this poem, it came about, uh, well, first of all, I have phonophobia, which is uh, the, the fear of like sudden loud noises. So I don't like balloons bursting. I don't like fireworks. I don't like guns, um, which, is, which is funny because it ends with the handsome pistol. The book ends with the handsome pistol. But, um, but yeah, so this poem, it sits in the first section of the book which introduces this um, idea of Americana, um, specifically, you know, the, the ephemera of, of, you know, American, that ideal, usually white Americanness, right? That, that, that sits in the past, um, in a past that was good for some of us and not, you know, many of us, not the rest, you know, many of us, it's not good. Um, and so one of the, one of the, the reason why it's here is because, okay, there is, so one, there is mention of the um, the ice cream truck song, which is um, I think it's oh, what's the what's how does the it's a racist song basically. It was a racist song, you know, this ice cream truck song, and um, and so the poem sort of ricocheted ricocheted out from that um, to become this sort of. Um, loud thing full of, of um, onomatopoeias, you know. Um, uh, and then at the center of the poem is this sort of vaudevillian, which is, an, you know, another form of Americana that we think of, this sort of vaudevillian routine. That's actually a story that happened between my brother and I. Um, and so, and so the po- this poem, like with many of my poems, it sort of begins, it sort of, um, it sits in the bio- biographical, but it expands out. So, um, so yeah, so what's happening in the background is, you know, all of these police killings and, um, and the speaker is trying to get away from that, uh, you know, through memory, but the speaker ends up there anyway, um, sort of moving towards joy. So I'll just read the poem. Uh, yes, I'll read the poem. Phonophobia. Body cam footage. The crackle and chirp of it anyway. I'm within earshot. I know what is about to happen again. Click the news site's window close. Open my window to geese barking a path across the man-made pond. The pond plopped near a quiet suburban lane. One flops over, pops up with a spray of grass in its beak. It turns its bearded head away to the road's new pitch. An ice cream truck blares the white noise of an old American song. The tune whips the air in my mouth into vanilla soft serve. Once, back in Detroit, my brother sent me out to shout for the Mr. Softy truck, two cones. So I said, little brother, Where's the other cone? You should have two. He always starts and upon hearing the beat, I chime in with. So then I said, I had to, but yours went splat on the ground. I just started slurping away on the other cone. None of this ever truly rings a bell for me. I never remember, yet want to remember. So I rattle off the learned script so that he can laugh. Then I can laugh harder 
which makes him laugh even harder until we both bark and crack up with tears streaming down our faces. We are so happy then. The guffaws, the chuckles, just one big snicker. We can't stop laughing. We laugh until we can't breathe. You think we are dying. Something you do so well, Tommy, is that sort of um, that juxtaposition of voices and tones and registers that ends up being so profoundly, again, like tense and sinister. You're just waiting for the other shoe to drop in the palm. And it's thank it's you. So, it's executed so sort of cinematically, and, and the pace of it is so spot on every time. Um, mm -hmm. It's just really amazing. It's really it means a lot, Maya. Thank you. Um, and I love what you said, the psychic power about um, Eduardo's, Eduardo's collection is that's on point as well. I mean, that's really exactly what you get in both um, in, in both your work and the one it was um, flatteringly compared to. I mean, it's, it's very true. Um, so uh, uh, the other sort of tension in, in American faith in this collection um, is sort of the fear of climate change of impending um, you know, um, environmental catastrophe that, that is irreversible. And um, I suppose in the same way I have a relationship to humor um, that is pronounced throughout the book, I have a relationship to beauty uh, and the idea, I suppose, um, that in the short term, I still want to admire everything that's beautiful and not look at it through the lens of elegy at all moments. There are times I think I succeed in doing that in the collection and there are others perhaps where there, you know, the elegy takes over. And I think this is um, one of those poems. I had been um, commuting to work and reading about the dwindling colonies of bees in 2013. And back then it was news. Now we barely talk about it, right? Um, which is a shame because we love to talk about honey in poems. Like it's a, we love bees, poets love bees. Um, but again, it's now old news because the other, there's so many crises that have accumulated since 2013, right? At the time, I remember we were all shocked to find out that bees were being um, slowly sort of becoming extinct. So um, this is a poem that thinks about extinction, um, but that also tries in its language to hold on to the beauty while it can and to hold on to this, idea of close description as a kind of reprieve or a balm from impending, um, impending destruction. Uh, oh, and I should say that it's one of five poems in the book that uses the term canceled glibly. And I often get asked at readings if um, I mean canceled the way that we mean it now. And I, and I don't, I wish I'd been that prescient and like could take credit for it because I'd probably be doing really well in sales. Take credit for it. Take yeah, credit for it. Exactly. It's like canceled on Twitter. I started it. Um, but I but I really what I'd been thinking about. So the poem is called The Bees Have Been Canceled. I was working in a in a sort of in a corporate -ish office and you know I kept getting emails saying the meeting is canceled. And I was thinking about how um, easily we use this term for any number of things that don't really matter and then how extinctions seem implausible or somehow not something we can hold in our minds the way we can hold a cancellation um, and a cancellation policy in our mind. The bees have been canceled. Never again, the humming saddled flowers. Never the blind oath by a velveteen prisoner. Never the yellow hula hooped in black little engine left running late into the darkness. Oh, how they were charming, clever monographs. Sunlight couldn't save them from the angel of extinction. Virgil said they swell with nectar's tilted knowledge. I don't know what to believe. Maybe they tired of being addicts, clover honey, garbage honey, accidental ice cream honey, ransomed stamen, sweet sinful, will do anything for honey. Maybe they caught fevers at midnight with no one there to hold their stingers, no fat queen to press a cold compress. How will we currency honey from wildflowers, that liquid of languages? How pollinate in the bee's electrostatic absence? How will the bellbirds take it, the Canterbury birds? 
Who will cast the last skeleton in amber? I'll miss the noise, the palimpsestic clamor, soft shock of discovering a hive under your roof. The lull as each integer walked its body over a blossom, then flew away with its instructions. <laughs> Thank you, Maya, Maya. Uh, uh, my graduate students are reading your book next, uh, so hopefully some of them are, are here. <laughs> In attendance later on, FYI. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's but that's one of the poems. Uh, uh, I think I you read it for Aras Poetica. Aras Poetica. What is that series? Oh yes, I did. I did. I read it for Aras Poetica. Exactly. Yes. I played, I played your reading of that. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. That's awesome. That's really. Yeah. If you don't know that series, it's a great series, right? Uh, because they have the poet reading their poem, and then as they utter a phrase, right, utter a, a bit of language, that language appears on the screen, right? So it's very it's beautiful. Great, great teaching tool, too. Okay, I think it's 6.48, so I'm going to read one more poem, and then the last 10 minutes, maybe we'll hold up, uh, have a Q&A session, a conversation. It went faster than I expected. Right? So that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, when I was working on my first book, and, but, and, and to a lesser degree, the second book, I was so petrified with, I, with the, the misguided belief that every poem in the book had to be amazing or really, really good. Of course, you want every poem to be good, right? But I think a whole book of good poems, how is that possible? I'm not, I'm not Bishop. <laughs> what is going on here? What is going on here, right? Then I realized, you know, every book needs peaks and valleys, right? And the way I kind of internalized that, that uh, sometimes uh, I want to have to write poems that, uh, that are like buttress poems, right? By themselves, maybe slight, a bit ornamental, but they support, right? The way a buttress and architecture supports a greater weight, right? But they support um, the themes and motifs, right? They underscore what's going on around it, right? They kind of amplify the poems in orbit, right? And that kind of was a kind of a, very important kind of breakthrough because it was like, it was a first of all, it kind of, okay. They don't all have to be this, right? Some of them could be doing this kind of work, right? So I'm always on the lookout when I write my books for these buttress moments, right? And one of those poems in the second book is a poem titled Questions for My Body, uh, which seems to be, uh, for me, it felt like a buttress poem, but people have responded to this, to this poem <laughs> really intensely, they I probably, is no longer a buttress poem. It feels a, 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 a kind of a central poem to the second book. Um, this poem is also rooted in that lyrical, that lyrical speaker's dilemma in, in this book. Uh, what happens to desire, yearning, lust when it's projected onto somebody, offered to somebody, and they polite, politely declined it. And um, that's you know, a big part of, of this book, which made it a, an immensely hard book to write. It was an impossibly hard book to write, right? I spent months and walking around thinking, oh, I cannot write those poems. I cannot write those poems, right? When I finally realized I have to write those poems. So questions for my body. Why are you nocturnal? How many cathedrals have you entered? Has cruelty ever saved you? Do you remember the length of his thumbs? Isn't that enough cake? Have you ever soaked your feet in gasoline? Do you still fear the virus? How can you sleep in this heat? Is that a soul patch? Did you laugh or cry at Keith's grave? Have you been claimed? Thank you all. Thank you, Maya and Tommy. That last line. <laughs> I got to convince you have buttress poems, Edouard, but I'm going right. like, to I love that idea. So I'm going to like take it for myself. I, like, I'm not convinced that's a good reading of your own work, but that's fine. <laughs> well, we often don't, or, or not really good readers on our own work at the end of the day, right? But, uh, yeah, but those lines came to me one by one and each one was like, oh, man, slow down, muse. <laughs> don't, gems, don't, gems. Don't, don't beat me up line by line, right? They are so, gems. Thank you all for joining us. And anybody has a question about anything we talked about, something in the book, uh, where I bought this yellow shelf, anything you want to ask. Mai, what color is the wall behind you? 
Um, I'm I'm gonna be really pretentious. I'll tell you exactly what color it is. It's uh, called Hague blue. Oh, that's pretty. Oh, cool. it's like a, a very kind of greenish, rich navy sort of thing. But you can't under this light. The lighting conditions are not good here. Yeah, it looks like a dark green to my eyes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it looks dark green. That's yeah. Beautiful. And they, I'm happy, and I'm happy your stack of books made it through. It did because there was, <laughs> as I said, I closed all the windows. <laughs> so, yeah, we have a question I hear from uh, Lola Adams. Maybe you could briefly each of us respond to this. Uh, what led each of you to poetry? You know, what is a catalyst to you becoming a poet? I'll start. It was. It was. It was. Um, so I started. I started seriously, well, not even seriously then, but it's when my ear was peaked to uh, poetry's lyric was when I heard Sonia Sanchez mm -hmm. in a, um, a recording of her in a uh, social studies class in my sophomore year at Michigan State University. I was an advertising major. Um, and I remember just uh, hearing her voice not necessarily understanding what she was saying, but like understanding what she was saying, right? Because because of the sounds of her voice, and I just fell in love. I just fell in love with the lyric, and I was like, "Oh my goodness! Okay, well, I'll, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna read it, you know, read it." And um, I joined the um, it's the Black Poets Society. Uh, it was like the first group of of that kind at Michigan State University. And um, I started writing horrible poems and doing open mic and stuff. And then in my senior year, uh, well, I started taking creative writing classes, but then in my senior year, um, I took my first intro to poetry course mm -hmm. and Diane Wachowski was my professor. I had no idea who Diane Wachowski was, no idea. I'm glad I didn't know until after the fact because I would have been freaked out. So yeah, and then Vivi Francis, but Vivi Francis, I always have to say this, Vivi Francis um, was truly the catalyst for me taking poetry seriously and like trying to work hard at it. Um, yeah, so I always have to say Vivi Francis's name because she's she's my everything. Oh, no, she's fantastic. Yeah. Eduardo, do you want to answer? You know, I came to poetry accidentally, and that's the truth. I never mm. imagined myself as a poet growing up. Uh, it's, it's very, you know, I signed up for a Mexican-American literature course as an undergrad at Arizona State University uh -huh. in the late 90s, if you can believe that, children, in the late 90s. And <laughs> uh, uh, the teacher, Dr. Lama, handed out, handed out the syllabus the first day of class, and I saw poetry workshop mid-semester. And I said to myself, hell no, who wants to write a poem? Who wants to be a poet? I'm poet dead. So after class, I just I was walking to the registrar's office to drop that course. I was like, I'm not gonna take this course. I'll, I'll find some other course to take. But I only kept that class because I met twice a week at 2 p.m. I said, you're not a morning person. You are an afternoon person. <laughs> so, so I kept that class and I wrote those poems, you know, because I was obligated to write them. And my professor saw something I didn't even know was there. Right? He asked me, how long have you been writing poetry? I said, about a week ago when you assigned this. <laughs> and then he said, well, write me more poems. So for a whole semester, I had an audience of one, and I wrote those poems for Dr. Adama. Yeah. And then he said, after a month or so, now that you're writing poetry, you should actually be reading it, which never dawned on me. <laughs> and then he gave me a book of poems, a book of uh, poets to check out. Rita Dove, Derek Walcott, Elizabeth Bishop, Gary Soto, Philip Levine, David St. John. I went to the library, and when I started reading those poets, that's when it happened. Mm. I fell in love with those those images, those lines. There's a line by Derek Walker. I first remember reading, the wind stretches, stretches its blanket over our heads, mm -hmm. right? And that's just had a, I just had a visceral reaction to it, right? I shook with pleasure, mm -hmm. right? And yes. I knew, I knew uh, there was something inter interesting to me, but what was key was audacity set in. What can I do? Yes, yes. That moment of, Okay, Mr. Walcott, you can say that, but what can I do? Yes, I, I yes. see you, Rita Dove. Well, yeah, I see what you're doing, but, but what can I do? What can I add yes. to the conversation? That was a moment for me. Yes. Oh. Those are my favorite stories, the, the, you know, the class fit, or I heard it through an open door. Like those, mm -hmm. there are those stories amongst, mm -hmm. you know, the makings, the origin stories of poets. And I think it's so, so moving. Um, I think I, so, I remember the first poem I remember writing or engaging with, I was in um, first grade, I'd been put by my parents um, 
who may be watching, so thanks mom and dad for this, but I was put into a French language school because they were um, non-native English speakers, but they spoke French like many Romanians do, and they just, you know, immigrated not long ago. And um, so I was put in a French school. I didn't speak French. I was maybe five or six. And truly, I remember so vividly that year being um, sort of like having directions barked at me and doing the opposite of what I was supposed to be doing at all times um, and feeling like a failure. Like I re vividly remember not knowing what was going on um, and wanting so hard, wanting to please and not doing it ever. Um, until one afternoon when we were shown um, poems, we were shown poems in French. And I can't say that, um, you know, it, it sounds so cheesy and it sounds like an epiphany moment, but for the first, truly for the first time, I didn't have a great handle on the language, but the language seemed flexible or manageable if you could put words together that did something musical and if you could have images. And I thought, okay, well, there are images in the world, then it can just happen in any language. It doesn't have to be in the language I speak at home. It doesn't have to be in Romanian. It doesn't have to be in English. It can be in any. So suddenly, um, and then we were told to write our own poems. And I, I remember thinking, like I'm gonna write about what it would be like to have um, a sibling that's an element. So what if I had a sister? I was obsessed with having siblings, I'm an only child. So I was like, ah, what if I had, you know, what if my sister was the rain and then I'd have many siblings. So I tried to write about that. It was the first time I didn't like utterly humiliate myself that year um, and then I didn't get yelled at. And um, so probably that was some sort of positive reinforcement is sort of the, yeah. the offhanded response. But the genuine response is I think I fell in love with the idea that language could do that, that you could tell someone something in images and it, it almost didn't matter if you didn't have a handle of it because images exist, you just have to find the words for it. So it felt like uh, mining for something that is there and that mm -hmm. like, like Tommy so, so wonderfully said about your word, a kind of magic, right? It felt like a kind of magic and still feels that way every time. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, very good, very good. I love that. Maybe uh, Bianca Rey has a question. Uh, are there any lines you all carry in your head readily of, of your own books, each of you? Oh. I mean, me for the, one of the lines, for second, for guillotine, a line that came on, a line that came to me pretty early and that kind of told me what the book was going to be about is the line, a wound is a self-reporting instrument. And they're like, oh, damn it. I know what this line is trying to give me, right? What, what it's trying to uh, suggest and gesture toward. And again, I resisted for a while, but it was in my head and I knew I, I had to uh, figure out all the shadows that line could cast, mm -hmm. right? all the shadows it could cast. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? What lines do you carry of your own? Um, for this particular book, the, the title poem, American Faith um, ends um, with a question about faith and then it, the last line is you are here now you must believe in something mm -hmm. um, and so I think for me that was part of the challenge of this book was to not make it utterly bleak and to see again sort of hold on to, to a sense of hope and a sense of um, you know purpose in everything that's happening so so that was the guiding principle for this one definitely wonderful Probably for me, um, <clears throat> it's from a poem that I very rarely read um, um, because uh, on another level, the, 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 in all the book is about beauty. It's, 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 yeah, it's about beauty. And so one of the, the poems, The Fable of the Beast, it has a couple of lines, very short lines. It goes something like, um, why not take his razor to find, why not take his razor across my face to find beauty where he says there is no beauty. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. That's yeah I think we're, we're at seven o'clock. So I think, we, should we wrap up or uh, can we have another question? What's the consensus from the, from our host? Uh, we don't have a super strict deadline. You can squeeze one more in. Okay. okay. This question is, uh, for you, Tommy, it's from uh, Aaron Trude, one of my graduate students. So, oh. Uh, she goes, Tommy, I'm curious about how play, how play, how much play there is in your reading of poems. And I'm wondering when you are writing, as you engage with deepness, how do you interact with that playful voice? Do you lean into it or, or how is it a tool? Hmm. So um, I really love theater um, and um, and I, 
I love theater, but I'm also in battle with my voice a little bit. I'm still coming around to, to at 41, I'm still coming around to accepting my voice and like liking my voice. Um, so one of the things- oh, you mean uh, Aesthetic, poetic voice or speaking? Voice? No, real voice, my real voice, this voice, yeah, right? You know what you mean. Um, yeah, and so, um, so one of the little, so one of the little things that I'm doing, I'm not sure if it's, if it's, it is play. One of the, there's a poem that I, there's a poem that I, that when I read it, I force myself to sing the last line of, <laughs> and it's, um, it's, um, um, uh, Leroy auditions at the Fame School, and it's the, mm -hmm. the last line is a, is a song there from uh, the Linda Clifford song that plays in the scene in Fame, um, and so. And so I, when I, when I, when I read that poem, I challenge myself to sing that. Um, this whole book has been a challenge for me. Uh, like I said, you know, about taking up space. And so for me now, it didn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't truly like this before, but now um, how the poems, how my poems feel in my body um, how they sit in my body is very important to me. Mm. Um, I was talking about the, one of the larger poems in the book, My God, Look Him Clean, and how um, Martha Rhodes, uh, you know, at first, at first I had the poems numbered and they had like um, this, the, the sections, they're, they're like these different sections that sort of braid and weave together from, you know, the past and the present and, you know, not so distant past. And um, they were numbered, but not in like a linear or chronological order. They kind of, you know, did that thing. And what I noticed when I, when I was reading it was I was out of breath because I was saying one and then I would say, you know, that little thing. And so Martha, and so Martha Rhodes said, well, this was, this was like one of her, this was one of her brilliant, but sm small suggestions. Said, well, well, what would it look like if you took the numbers out? And so I did that and it completely changed how that poem said in my body. Like it, it felt like a living, breathing thing. Like mm. it pulsed and moved and, and I pulsed and moved with it, right? Um, so yeah, so I, I hope I answered the question. I mean, mm. for the, I mean for the book to be a kind of moving, breathing thing, my poems to be kind of a moving, breathing thing in the way that I experience good theater um, yeah. where, um, where I'm not just um, I'm not just an audience sitting idly by. Like the performers are demanding something of me. They 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 want me to join into this sort of larger organism, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, when I, every time a poet gets up to a, a, a microphone and says, "I want to only read one poem," and they begin one, <laughs> <in> my heart. <laughs> 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 One po how, how many sections are we going to get? How many sections are we going to get? No, oh, my heart starts going, oh, no. Yeah. You know, Carl, Carl Phillips does the, the thing where he tells you how many, he says there are, I think he, he said something like there are six sections or something, or some, it was either Carl Phillips or somebody else that does this. They go, there are six sections in this poem. <laughs> to prepare you. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tommy. Thank you, Maya. For Thank you, Eduardo. Me. Thank you, Maya. Everybody to pick up Anna. Tommy's and Maya's debuts. They're fantastic. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Politics and prose. Thank you all for joining us. Yes, and thank you, each of you, for our wonderful panel discussion. Um, thank everyone for tuning in. We have Politics and Prose, and we look forward to seeing what next works you have coming for us in the future. Not a novel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Maya, Tommy. Thank you. thank you guys so much. Thank you.